Thank you, Phil. You know, after uh, it is a privilege for me to be here and to do this with you guys. Um, man, after these four little ladies did their poem, we sang that song together, and those men do that. I'm saying, amen, Lord, let's go home. <laughs> you know, praise God for the message of the gospel in the light of revelation that we're going to look at here uh, this morning. I'm, it's, we'll be in Luke chapter 2. I'm going to be working from 21 through 35. So I'm going to read it in chunks as we go along, okay? I'm not going to read through the whole thing and then go back and go through it again um, just to save a little bit of time. But to set that up a little bit, had, I'm sorry, it's just been a wonderful service to this point. God is so good, and the gospel is so awesome, and uh, Christmas to remember that God became man, literally deity in human flesh come together. Uh, the uh, incarnation of Jesus Christ is like, this is the pivotal point in all of history. Now, the big moment of the cross is yet to come, 33-ish years. But the incarnation that God would become man is an amazing, amazing miracle that sometimes we don't uh, think deeply enough about. So one of the things, the question, the big question that I want to ask is to frame this a little bit because I want us to think, what are you looking for? What are the main passions of your life? Um... A lot of things can drive us, and, and, and in and of themselves, not necessarily anything wrong with that. It can be growth in my work. I, w- I want to grow. I want to uh, succeed at what I do. I want to learn new skills. Nothing wrong with that and having that kind of a passion. Is that your main passion? That's the question that we're asking. What is the main passion of your life? It can be our families. Our families need to be a passion. You're, if you're married and you have children, your children need to be a passion in your life. But is it your main passion? And when you think of your kids, what is your main passion for them? Is it their uh, happiness and their success? Or is it their spiritual growth and stability with the Lord? Is that your main passion for your kids? There is, they can be related, but they're certainly not the same because often spiritual growth requires a lot of suffering to go with it. And it's not all happy. So what is the main passion? And we'll hopefully come back to that, if I can be mindful, at the end of our time together. But be thinking about that. We're going to see a guy here, uh, Simeon, whose passion was the coming one, the Messiah. We, We know very little of Simeon here. We'll see that. Handful of verses. But the thing that he's remembered for is he longed for the Messiah to come. What's your passion? One more. What do you hope for in 2022? A few more days and we transition to a new year. I don't know if you're going to say good riddance to 2021, but uh, 2020, 2021 have certainly been unusually difficult years. Uh, in culturally, the, between the virus and the social unrest and all that's going on, But what are you looking for in 2022? Maybe you're hoping that the economy will stabilize and we'll start to enjoy some of the abundance again, right? Simple thing. Kath, uh, we wanted to make some cheesy potatoes for our family get-together. Go to Meyer for some frozen hash browns? Mm Mm-mm, none. Nap Meyer? None. Family fair? None. So I sat at the counter with her and we cut potatoes and made, and she got her dish done. My point is, though, the supply, right? It's not what it was. Maybe you're hoping that that'll stabilize. Maybe you're hoping that social unrest and civil disturbance will kind of quiet down and 2022 will be a quiet year. Then again, maybe you're wondering where our country's going to be at the end of the year. What are we going to look like? And in many ways, we are standing in the dark because we don't know. We don't know. I can't tell you what's going to happen before the end of the service, let alone a year from now. And so we're standing in the dark. The God these guys just sang about, he's in the light. He is the light. And Jesus will not be surprised by what happens this year because he's sovereign and his hand guides it. But we stand in the dark 
And then we live in a society that uh, is quickly moving away. If you've lived for very long, you've seen massive decline in our country. We have. Incredible technological innovation still. It's amazing, some of the stuff that's being done. It just blows you away. The problem is, is by and large, that's all done from a world and life view that's, ba- that's not based in anything solid. It's standing in midair, no foundation. Instead, it's based in a, a, a naturalistic view of the world, not even a theistic view of the world, let alone a biblical world and life view. Sorry. So we become immersed in a world of despair that papers it over with a veneer of expressive individualism where I, the individual, is what everything is all about and what I feel is what's important in the world. And it's all about me. That's us. And we are the, the typical, the, the now is the expressing of the self is front and center, and the self is the center of the world for most people in modern times. It's just is. And then in our story, we've been telling over the last, this will be the fourth Sunday, of the songs of Christmas are about God who became man and enters in among us. And into that story today comes this prophet named Simeon. And he gets a very brief mention here. We don't know much about Simeon except for what we read here. Certainly a prophet. Don't know, might have been a farmer, could have been a tradesman. We just just don't know. But he was a man who pursued the, the Messiah and has a key part in the story and we'll look at his song we've been looking at the songs of Christmas and before I forget this song uh, Nunc Dimittis Nunc Dimittis from the Latin translation of the text and uh, now let depart that's what this uh, from verse 29 to verse 32 that's Nunc Dimittis now let depart from the Latin ordering of the words of that text, but we're not, we're not there yet. We'll, we'll get there. Let's take a look now, reading, uh, starting in verse 21. Let me read a few verses here. When eight days had passed before his circumcision, his name was then called Jesus, the name given b- by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. You remember? Phil talked about this just a couple weeks ago. This young virgin girl, Mary, teenage girl, And this angel says, you're going to be with child by the Holy Spirit, and you'll name him Jesus. And so they do. He's named Jesus, and when the days for their purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves and two young pigeons. And so here you have this young couple, Mary. It says, when the days of their purification, and we're going to look at this a little bit. Now first, um, there was, in the law, there is the instructions about when you have the firstborn male that you bring him to the Lord and there's a redemption price that has to be paid, a five shekel redemption price for the firstborn male. That's something that they will do in the temple. We'll look at that in a second. Um, in uh, Exodus 13, 2, sanctify to me every firstborn, the first offspring of every womb among the sons of Israel, both of man and of, belie- uh, of beast, it belongs to me. When you read the text in Exodus, it's interesting. Um, the, the, uh, the destroying angel has come through and killed all the firstborn in Egypt, you remember, except for the children of Israel who had the blood on the lintel and the doorpost. And before the text even moves on and talks about crossing the Red Sea, God says, sanctify to me every firstborn. Never forget what's been done here. The firstborn are mine forever. Text goes on when uh, 
as Mary when it talks about her purification. There's, uh, it's interesting, and, and there's not time to go, to go into all of this, but uh, the, the days of purification for a male child were 40 days, and for a female child were 80 days. Interesting. The theologians talk about that a little bit. And however that may be, when the days of her purification, so we know Jesus was at least 40 days old when they brought him to the temple. Because her purification days would have been 40 days for a male child. So he's at least 40 days old when they bring him to the temple. Uh, in uh, Leviticus 12, then, it talks about this whole uh, thing of purification, because that's why they're coming to the temple, for her purification and to pay that five shekel uh, tax for the firstborn male. When the days of her purification, uh, Leviticus 12:6. When the days of her purification are completed for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring to the priest at the doorway of the tent of meeting a one-year-old lamb for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering. Law of the Lord. This is what you do. Now, it's interesting. In our text here, it says, verse 24, Offer a sacrifice according to what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves and two young pigeons. But the law says bring a lamb. Well, you go a little farther in Leviticus, down to verse 8, Leviticus 12, 8. But if she cannot afford a lamb, then she shall take two turtle doves or two young pigeons, the one for a burnt offering, the other for a sin offering, and the priest shall make atonement for her and she shall be clean. The point is, these are poor people. See, Jesus, read Philippians 2 this afternoon, the kenosis passage, they call it, but the emptying of Christ when God became man. He wasn't born in the king's palace, as maybe we would see. He wasn't born there to displace Caesar. He was born and laid in a trough to poor people. That's where Jesus came, God, when he became man. And here we see uh, further the humiliation of the Savior as he's born to parents who are among the poor. That's not to disparage the poor by any means. As a matter of fact, Jesus lifts up the poor. Remember, later he'll say, you will always have the poor with you, but me you'll only have for a short time. Um, he, he, he lifts up the poor. But he also said in Matthew five seventeen, do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And we see in his parents bringing him to the temple to fulfill the law, that even in that, the Son of God fulfills every jot and tittle of the law in his lifetime. Then verse 25. Let's read, uh, I'm going to read down through 28. And there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the uh, Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law, then he took him into his arms and blessed God. And we see the old prophet. As he enters the story, he's described as being righteous and devout. In, in Scripture, for you for to be described as righteous, this is a person who's been justified before God. You remember Abraham? Abraham believed God, and God credited it to him as righteousness. This is before the cross. So yes, Jesus is here in the flesh as an infant, but the atonement has not been made yet. Justification is by faith. And this is a man who's looking to the Messiah and saying, I believe God, my only hope is you. I have no self-righteousness. In my own, I'm cursed. And he's declared righteous on the basis of his faith. Simeon was a spirit-filled believer who looked to the coming of Messiah who would remove the burden of sin. I'm going to move this pencil. <laughs> He's a spirit-filled believer, and he looked to the coming of Messiah. When it says there in verse 25, this man was righteous, devout, looking for the consolation of Israel, the consolation of Israel, the coming of the Messiah, when when the, the hope was that Israel would be freed from her persecutors and our sin problem will be handled and will be, God will be our king. Now in God's timing, 
Jesus is not yet reigning. He will. But this man is looking forward to the day. And he comes into the temple. Now, uh, this is, uh, I'm getting my pages messed up. You ever do that, Phil? Coach? <laughs> Later on, we'll talk. Um, so in verse uh, 27, and he came in the spirit into the temple when the parents brought in the child Jesus. Let's, uh, uh, let's bring up that temple illustration on the PowerPoint. Okay, so uh, around the outside, and this is not the best illustration, but this is uh, Herod's temple. So this would be the temple that was standing when Jesus was there. It was actually a construction site. They were still building it. They wouldn't finish till about 65 AD, and in 70, the Romans will tear it down. Destroy it. But out here in the white, around the outside, that's the court of the Gentiles. And at these passageways, this four or five foot high wall, and through these passageways to get up into where the temple is, um, there, were, there were markers there. Gentile on pain of death will go any farther. In other words, only Jews go inside beyond that or face execution. That, that was the law. This is the temple proper, Holy of Holies, back here. A perfectly cubical room, length, width, height, the same. And the Ark of the Covenant would have been in there. And in this area here, the, the uh, altar of incense, the, uh, the, the candle stand, and on the other side, the uh, showbread would be in there. And out around the court of the uh, priests, and so the sacrifices would happen out here, the court of the men where they could get in close. And then... Out here, the court of the women, it's interesting, the word used for temples is, refers to the entire precincts or the big area because the point is Mary would be allowed here and no further. So when the old prophet meets her, probably in the court of the women because that's all the farther in she can go. And the purpose for them to be here is for the paying of the five shekel tax, uh, the great horn-shaped receptacles, it said, where the offerings were placed. Remember Jesus and the widow with the mites, and she's putting in her offering. Probably one of those great horn-shaped receptacles. And probably when Mary and Joseph get there, there's a temple official. Okay, you're, you're young. It's my firstborn. I've never done this. Where do I go? Where do I stand? What do I say? What do I do? Temple official to help them, probably. Here's where your five shekels go. Help them get it in the right place. Also verify that they did it. And then uh, the offering of the sacrifice, maybe Mary was allowed to stand up here on the raised dais here to see through because the altar would have been right over in, in this area and to see when the sacrifice is given on her behalf. And it's into this circle that the old prophet walks up. And here they hold this baby. Maybe at that moment over there, sacrifice is happening on her behalf, and they're holding in their hands the sacrifice for the sin of the world. Maybe not with the eyes to see that yet. It's a growing revelation to Mary and to Joseph. But Simeon, he walks up with eyes that no one else had, and he realizes that as they offer the purification sacrifices, they're holding in their hands the literal ultimate Lamb of God. I mean, it's an incredible picture. And then we see the old prophet as he lifts this baby. I don't know how that worked. Okay, you're a mom, moms. You let any guy that walks up say, hey, can I hold your kid? Your dad will probably drill him in the mouth if he does that, right? I mean, it's just the old prophet walks up to him, and he takes the Christ child and lifts the child And that's when the song starts. And the fulfillment of his life purpose, verse 29, Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. Look at verse 26. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Now you're releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation. He's holding it right here in his hands. A light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. It's interesting, verse 29, now Lord, the word there, Lord. In 
uh, the New Testament, there's a handful of words that are translated Lord, capital L, lowercase o-r-d. 662 times in the New American Standard, 662 times in the New American Standard, the word Lord appears 644 times. It's the word kurios, common word for Lord. Here, the word that is used is despotes, despot, used only three times in the New Testament. We get the word despot from it. The, the idea of absolute ruler, sovereign Lord, or master. And he goes on, and you are leasing your bondservant, doulos, manslave. And now, despot, you are releasing your manslave to go in peace. It's my eyes have seen your salvation. The sole focus of his life was on seeing the Messiah. And he sees him. And my life is fulfilled and I can go. This is a man who sees himself in utter subjection to his master and he's waited on him with a heart of service to the desires of his master. For the whole purpose of his life. What does my master want? Jesus later, in, in Luke 17, 10, talking to his disciples, he says, So you too, when you do all the things that are commanded you, say, we are unworthy slaves. We've only done that which we ought to have done. See, this is the focus of the servant of Christ. Anything I can do from him, for him is just the minute. I'm just doing what I ought to have done. And, he, and, and the master can't ask too much. And now this one who has obeyed he wait, and waited, he asked for release from his yoke of service according to your word. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture. The fulfillment here of all, of all of the Old Testament scripture regarding the birth of the Christ child. It's an amazing thing. Verse 30, my eyes have seen your salvation. Isaiah, a number of prophecies in Isaiah about the Messiah. We'll look at just a couple of them. Isaiah 52.10, the Lord has bared his holy arm in the sight of all the nations that all the ends of the earth may see the salvation of of our God. Isn't that interesting? My eyes have seen your salvation. He's literally holding it in his hands. <laughs> and Isaiah says, this is coming. And the, all the earth may see the salvation of our God there in verse uh, 31, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples. This isn't a secret, the birth of the Christ child. Now it's, it is a progressing revelation But Isaiah said there in another place in chapter 45, verse 22, Turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God, then there is no other. The, the point being this event of the Christ child is for all of humanity. This is not just for the Jews. It is for them. But it's for all of humanity, the message of who Jesus is and what he has done, verse 32. A light of revelation to the Gentiles. Remember, up until Christ, the gospel or the message of salvation was for the Jews. Doesn't mean there were no Gentiles who came, but few and far between. God was talking to the Gentiles, or to the Jews. And now it's a light of revelation to the Gentiles. Paul, 50, 55 years from now, the apostle Paul will be on trial before Agrippa. And in a matter of a few days, he's going to be sent off to Rome to be on trial for his life. And he relates to Agrippa on that Damascus road about the light and how he was blinded. And he tells Agrippa the story. And in Acts uh, 26, 17 to 18, the Lord uh, s says to Paul, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles, to whom I am sending you, look, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith 
in me, turning from darkness to light and from dominion of Satan to God because from, from that point, from Noah to that point, there was minimal revelation to the world. He was talking to the Jews. And the gospel is for everybody. And it's a light. You look at our nation when you wonder about dark days. Remember the light. I love the focus of this morning. That song you, those guys did, that just blows me away. The gospel is a bright light that you can hold on to in the darkest days. Look what Simeon says. Cause just, now put your place, uh, yourself in the place of Joseph and Mary. <laughs> and his father and mother were amazed at the things which were being said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel and for a sign to be opposed and a sword will pierce even your own soul to the end that many thoughts... Uh, that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And his father and mother were amazed at verse, yeah, you think? Right? So right, just a, a, a few months ago, Mary had this, like Gabriel appears to him, to her, and gives her this revelation. And she knows, if nobody in the world believes, she knows that how that baby came to her. I mean, that's incredible, right? And Joseph, he's like, what do I do? I've got this betrothed girl who's pregnant and I don't want to disgrace her but I can't marry her so an angel appears in a dream to him so they've had that and then this thing about the angel or the uh, uh, the shepherds and these guys these shepherd guys come in and they tell this story about angels and singing and all that about the Christ child I mean these, these people are being blown away and now Simeon comes in and he says, now, Lord, you are releasing your bond servant in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation. And he's looking at their kid, that their little baby boy, who they know is very special, but they don't know how it's special yet. And they're just blown away. Mary drops out of the, or Joseph drops out of the narrative. We don't hear any more of him. But if you carefully read through Luke, you'll see here and there where Mary treasured these things in her heart or Mary pondered these things in her heart. And 33-ish years from now, she's going to stand at a cross and her son is going to die right there in front of her. The sword will pierce your own soul. And then a few days later, she's going to be in an upper room with the apostles because they've seen the risen Christ, and then they watched him ascend into heaven. And just so we're clear, and Phil did a good job with this, Mary was a sinner who had to be saved by grace, just like everybody else. Even though she was the human mother of the Christ, a sinner that had to be saved by grace, And we want to be very, very clear. The only mediator you have is Jesus. There is one Timothy, 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6. There's one God and one mediator also between God and men. The man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all. The testimony given at the proper time. We, We honor Mary as the mother of Christ. But Mary was a sinner who had to be saved by grace like everybody else. And we're going to see her, I believe, in heaven. And she has an honored role that no person, right? Only one, one mom, special lady. Not my redeemer. Only Jesus. That's the point. Well, we can go on, but we got to get done. Let's look at some application then. So I, have, I put this, uh, these application points in the form of questions. I've been trying to do that because uh, I, 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 I want you to think. And then, but the first one, um, it, it applies to all of us in the room, and if you're online and watching, to think seriously about this. Number one, instead of just a baby at Christmas, do you know this Jesus as Savior and Lord? This is not just a warm, fuzzy, don't we love the holiday event. There are some really great family traditions and things that this time of year brings out, and we're not down on that. But it's not just about my tradition and how 
warm and fuzzy I feel. Jesus is God in the flesh who would die and be resurrected and ascend to heaven to pay the penalty for sin. Do you know Jesus as Savior and Lord? Here's Peter at Pentecost when he preached his sermon and they say, what do we do? Peter says, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. Repent. What do I do? Repent. Paul, later, uh, and Silas, remember the Philippian jailer? He brings them out, and after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Put the two passages together. What do I do? How do I know Jesus is Savior and Lord? Repent and believe. That's what we do. Repent and believe, and that's our appeal for all of us, that we know the Lord through repentance and belief. And if you, if you want that and you need help with that, man, we'd love to do that. Phil would, I would, there are others. Talk to the person next to you, likely they would like to do that. Just saying, we want you to have that gift. Number two, here's our original question again. What do the main passions of your life consist of? What is it you're looking for? In uncertain and unstable times, we can find ourselves fixating on stability. I, I, I appreciate stability. <laughs> but we can get fixated. And even in stable times, we can get focused on my goals and my desires. Good to have goals. Good to have desires. Work on them. Be all that you can be to serve the Lord. But what is the main thing? Jesus, <laughs> later in Luke chapter 12, said to them, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. That's 1215. And, and speaking there in the immediate of possessions, but the point or the, the uh, principle applies to all of life, if not possession, possession of physical things, possession of skills, possession of family. And I make that ultimate. And Jesus says, Beware. For where your treasure is, verse 34, there your heart will be also. What are you looking for? What's your main passion? And here's the last one that maybe will help us to think about that because I think it's directly uh, related to it. Number three, do you long for heaven? Do you long to see Jesus in a broken world when we struggle and we wonder Paul, in uh, talking to, writing to Titus in chapter 2, 11 to 13, he said, For the grace of God has appeared, didn't he, in a baby. And Simeon, what a privilege. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Listen, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Do you long for heaven? Heaven is where Jesus is. That's heaven. And someday, we believe, he's coming to this earth and he's going to rule forever and ever and ever. And that's heaven because you're with Jesus. Do you long for heaven? More than just a baby at Christmas. He's Savior and Lord, and he is literally the light of revelation. No Jesus, no hope. Praise God, he came, and he's revealed himself to us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, <laughs> Lord, it is you in eternity past who decreed what would come to pass and knowing full well of the sin that we would fall into had already laid the foundation for a plan for the redemption of mankind in an amazing, amazing way. Thank you for a Savior who identifies with us in every way. 
born as a baby so he could live a perfect, sinless life so that we, as we're declared righteous, could be put on the righteousness of Christ that he won as he lived out his life here on this earth. And so, Lord, we just want to glorify you today. We want to praise the name of Jesus. I thank you for all those who have participated today. It's been such a blessing to be with your people. Lord, be glorified. Use us, each one of us, uh, this year to spread the news abroad, we, pl we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.